community development. Congressman Henry Gonzalez of Texas chairs the panel, which reviews the administration's plan to reform the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Testifying before the panel is HUD Secretary Jack Kemp. The subcommittee also examines the closing of a thrift association in California. The uh, committee will please come to order. The Committee on uh, Banking, Finance, and Urban Affairs once again welcomes our distinguished former colleague and now Secretary of HUD, Secretary Kemp. In order to uh, again hear from him, I think uh, the members will recall that early after his uh, confirmation, he uh, not only came before our committee once, but twice, second time with the subcommittee on housing. And in fact, we had a full day's hearing. I believe we held on to him from about 10 o'clock to almost 5 p.m. I would like to make it eminently clear that all of us on this committee are supportive of reform in the manner in which the department's business is conducted. As I look at the so-called scandals that have been revealed at HUD, it's my view that we have seen a uh, people's problem and not so much a program problem. What we have had in the last eight years at HUD are ambitious and rather self-seeking uh, people who betrayed public trust. I make the distinct distinction between scandalous mismanagement and the integrity of the HUD programs. Let me be clear. These programs work when people of goodwill are there to administer them. There's no way we can pass laws to make people good or to make administrators honest and efficient. We're faced with two unnatural disasters. The swamp, as it has been amply called, of mismanagement at HUD and the quicksand with the housing needs that we see so sadly portrayed in the case of the homeless. The results of these two unnatural disasters are homelessness, housing that is unaffordable or non-existent for many of our citizens. I'm pleased, Mr. Secretary, that we're hearing from you on administrative and management reforms. Many of the reforms can be accomplished administratively or through regulatory changes, and some will require some legislation. I believe that we cannot stop at just dealing with the reforms necessary to make the department work. We need to retool housing programs as part of a total package. I believe that there is a strong sense of support for the reform proposals, but these must be accompanied by revitalized housing assistance programs along with new and creative approaches. We must act on reform legislation at the same time that we reauthorize a commitment to providing more affordable housing. Mr. Secretary, on July the 12th, 1989, you well stated the principle that many of us on this committee and subcommittee on housing hold strongly when you said, and I quote, I did not want any of the problems that HUD to be a subterfuge for an assault on programs, people, poor people, or policies that were designed to help develop the great needs of this country to house and shelter the poor and to make sure that first-time home buyers and affordable housing had affordable housing and we could develop our urban ghettos, boroughs, and rural communities as well, end of quote. So, Mr. Secretary, we will take you up on this statement work cooperatively with you on enacting HUD reforms, but we also expect to enact the essential assisted housing reauthorization. And with that, I'd like to recognize our preeminent minority leader of the committee, Mr. Wiley of Ohio.
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I think there is no doubt but that uh, Congress and the administration must uh, work hand in hand to uh, clean up the problems related to uh, mismanagement within HUD. Uh, Secretary Kemp has had to assume an unanticipated burden of uh, flawed programs like hospital insurance and uh, co-insurance, uh, which have severely weakened uh, the FHA insurance funds problems related to favoritism, mismanagement, and some ill-conceived uh, programs have uh, created a, a critical need for reform at HUD. And, Mr. Chairman, I know that you, more than anyone, are truly aware of the pressing need for reform because we've discussed it. And I would say this to your credit, that you were willing to give Secretary Kemp the time and the opportunity to thoroughly evaluate the problems within his department. Earlier this year, the Secretary was before our committee and he promised to clean up HUD from stem to stern. Well, the uh, comprehensive reform package announced by the Secretary last week is a decisive step in that direction. The proposal addresses three major areas of concern, ethics, management and finance, and the Federal Housing Administration in a positive way. And I think the uh, package put forth by Secretary Kemp is truly emergency legislation. Uh, there are some uh, parts of it uh, which uh, are not altogether to my liking, but I think in the overall it is a good package. We need to pass this package before we go on with uh, major housing legislation. We must wipe the slate clean, and the abuses at HUD must be cleared up first. And I am confident, uh, Mr. Chairman, under your leadership, the Banking Committee can swiftly bring a bipartisan HUD package reform uh, bill to the uh, House floor, and you are to be commended for your patient, thoughtful approach and your willingness to hear recommendations from our esteemed former colleague whose testimony I look forward to hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Wiley, and, and you've stated very correctly uh, from the outset, the 101st Congress, you and I have uh, pledged to work cooperatively on a bipartisan basis, which uh, I think all through legislative history of the Congress uh, shows that's when it works most effectively. I would want to say something, and that is that there's some confusion in the external world not given to our methods. Uh, the public has been reading, of course, about the hearings by the housekeeping but non-legislative uh, committee on government operations and the subcommittee that has under its uh, jurisdiction, uh, the aspect of the housing uh, programs. It's a non-legislative committee, and just uh, about a week and a half ago, I sent to each member, and I thought the secretary as well, a letter, a copy of a letter that I directed to Mr. Lantos, chairman of that subcommittee of government operations, including a copy of the report uh, given to me by the Inspector General of HUD, which was in answer to the second letter that I had referred to him a year and three months or so ago, the first one on June the 9th and the second one on June the 24th. And he was replying to my June 24th request, and it had to do with the um, Section 8 existing programs. And it was very disturbing, and reported to Mr. Lantos so that uh, he would continue. His original set of hearings were based on the Inspector General's report in answer to the request we made a year ago in June. If uh, I think the gentleman recall, I think we also joined in that one. So I would like to ask unanimous consent that the record of the proceedings this morning contain the letter to Mr. Lantos as well as the copy of the Inspector General's report. <laughs> and without objection, it is so ordered. Uh, Ms. Rockema, did you have a statement? You're the uh, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate uh, your courtesy here, and I certainly want to thank Mr. Kemp for making time in his uh, pressing schedule to meet with us so promptly. We do appreciate that. And for you, Mr. Chairman, for arranging this schedule. 
Uh, I also wanted to stress the fact that uh, the abuses that have come to light have been uh, the result of uh, examinations by other committees as well as this committee and the uh, hearings that you initiated uh, and the inquiry you initiated as you have just stated. My sense is that we are coming to the end of uh, the investigative phase of the scandal, at least I would hope so, and there are two more phases to follow. One, of course, is the um, thorough and vigorous investigation, not only by HUD, but also by the Justice Department. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that some of my, the, the full text of my statement be included in the record. And I'd like to just uh, summarize my observations here. Uh, beyond the Justice Department investigation, of course, uh, this subcommittee must consider essential legislative reforms and the house cleaning that HUD needs, if you will. Uh, that is our responsibility, and we are the committee of uh, authorization here. Several proposals have already been introduced, one, of course, by the chairman of the Employment and Housing Subcommittee, Mr. Lantos, others by uh, Mr. Schumer of New York, and uh, one by myself, and a number of co-sponsors on this committee. I said at the time that I introduced my bill, that this is one of many proposals and that I look forward to working with my colleagues and the Secretary and his people to enact a compromise and a comprehensive bill that will deal not only effectively with the abuses and the potential abuses and corruption, but also one that will be administratively sound, not cosmetic, but uh, faithful to our constitutional responsibilities to protect the public trust. Mr. Chairman, uh, I do want to say something about Secretary Kemp's uh, outstanding efforts thus far. No cabinet secretary that I know has inherited a bigger, more complex set of problems. The secretary has faced these problems admirably, squarely, and courageously, in my opinion, and uh, has been a true public servant in the nonpartisan way he has addressed these issues. Uh, he's going a long way towards the house cleaning that we need. I was particularly pleased to see, and we will follow up with questions today, but to see in the legislation uh, that has been recommended by the Secretary, the mandatory disclosure of consultants' activities, the sunshine, if you will, that we need to shed on this problem, strengthening the authority of the Inspector General, making him a legitimate whistleblower in the best sense of the word, and the creation of a chief financial officer, a real watchdog, a financial watchdog. All of these are major provisions in uh, a number of the bills that we've discussed, certainly in the Secretary's recommendations and the bill that I have co-sponsored. I also would say that this is, again, just a first step, and we must go much further in terms of providing the needed housing and the reforms and follow-up procedures that I'm looking for the Secretary, towards the Secretary for his fine leadership. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Rockema. If uh, any other member desires to be heard, I'll be glad to recognize them briefly. If not, we'll just have general leave to um, place in the record any prepared statements you might wish to make. Uh, also, uh, without any objection, we'll place your prepared text, uh, Ms. Rockema, in the Thank record. Thank you. I've been advised that uh, the Assistant Secretary for Housing and, I believe, uh, FHA, uh, Ms. Austin Fitz, uh, has to leave here by uh, 11.40, is that correct? So uh, I do welcome the help you're giving me to proceed and will recognize the Secretary. Mr. Chairman, just a brief comment. Uh, yes, uh, welcoming the Secretary wouldn't want to... Uh, Thank you, Bruce. We want him to let her know we're here. And it's better to talk to him early in the morning, I guess, than later in the day. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I, we appreciate the effort that the, uh, the Secretary has put into the reform and his uh, positive uh, attitude to recognize the problems that have existed there. Uh, we also <clears throat> appreciate our colleagues on the, in the Congress that have done uh, and are doing a thorough job of investigation with regards to the uh, uh, with regards to the housing, the problems uh, in HUD, uh, that, that investigation goes on. Uh, Mr. Secretary and Mr. Chairman, one of the problems that, uh, that we have, of course, is that 
Uh, we're talking about uh, reframing a lot of the, in a fundamental way, I guess, some of the uh, housing programs and uh, assistance programs that we have. As we know from last week's uh, uh, March in Washington, Housing Now, as we know from the uh, renewed interest in housing and the serious problems that are occurring with regards to the homeless with two to three million people, uh, it is urgent that we recast uh, many of the housing policies that have existed in the past. And while there may be some uh, generic uh, issues that uh, should be addressed in terms of reform, not just in HUD, but in across the board with regards to uh, uh, the executive agency, sadly, some of that uh, the effort was uh, vetoed in the last uh, minute uh, uh, of the uh, of the president, uh, the last president's term, when we tried to do some reform in a generic way there. But what I'm what I'm pointing to is that I'm willing to to go along with some generic reforms. But I think that we have to know what the programs are before we can decide, uh, in a sense, uh, what type of reforms or what type of uh, safeguards we need. We have to know what the magnitude of the problems are. That is to say, that the investigations have to be. Uh, at least substantially concluded before we can do that. And I know it's the spirit that these are offered uh, in is, uh, is a good one, and I accept that. I just wanted to, at the onset, uh, point out my, my concerns. And I, I want to do uh, work in the reform. I also want to work on the major task of addressing the housing needs that we have. I hope that we can go together uh, hand in hand and uh, deal with both of these problems at once, Mr. Chairman. As you know, we've had a series of measures in. Uh, we've been uh, bogged down with the dealing with the, uh, the SNL crisis. Uh, now we're going to uh, deal with reform, but I think that housing really uh, should not be put in the back burner. I think we ought and owe it uh, our best effort, and I hope that that's the spirit which prevails in this committee and within the administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bento. I had alluded to that in my statement. Mr. Secretary, we're prepared now. Thank and, you. Uh, we thank you again very much. You were here very promptly at 9.30. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, first of all thank you, um, Chairman Gonzalez, and uh, your ranking uh, Republican member uh, Chalmers Wiley, and all of the members of the committee from whom, frankly, we have gotten a lot of our ideas for reform, may I say, on both sides of the aisle. Marge Rockema mentioned that, uh, uh, Congressman Konjorski. Uh, uh, Congressman Frank, uh, uh, members on both sides, including the chairman and the ranking. I don't know if there is a more bipartisan issue in the United States than today than reforming this agency and making it work for people who are hurting out there in urban and, frankly, rural America. So let me say at the outset that I can't imagine a more important task for a bipartisan consensus uh, to work on than to, with a sense of urgency and uh, emergency, uh, re these reforms that come from the Congress, come from both parties, come from the IG, come from the GAO, come from our staff, and come from the gross abuses uh, of the past and the empirical evidence that has been uncovered uh, by the timely investigation uh, by not only this committee, Mr. Chairman, and your interest uh, in uh, these audits from the IG, but also that of the Government Ops Committee under the chairmanship of uh, Tom Lanto. So uh, I hope that my testimony today will reflect the sense of commitment that I personally feel, as does my uh, team or colleagues at HUD. And let me, for the record, Mr. Chairman, introduce uh, Al Delabovi, the Under uh, Secretary, and Frank Keating, my General Counsel, and Austin Fitz, you alluded to earlier, as our Commissioner for Housing uh, and the FHA. Um, uh, other members are, are here, um, and uh, we have approached this with a sense of urgency and timeliness and hopefully bipartisanship, because I don't think it'll work without that. So that's the predicate that I would hope to lay before the committee as I begin my testimony. Um, let me make one other uh, very strong statement before this committee. I did in my press conference of last Tuesday, uh, a week ago, and I want to make it uh, here uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, this president, and this Secretary of Housing uh, and Urban Development 
consider it not only a high priority, but a public good or public responsibility or fiduciary responsibility to have zero tolerance of the types of abuses that have taken place in the past. Uh, the men and women that I have chosen and President Bush appointed, uh, the people who have been working on this package, uh, have attempted uh, to put the cards on the table, let the chips, so to speak, uh, fall where they may. And let me say parenthetically, I think every known metaphor to human experience has been uh, used uh, 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 over and over and over again in this uh, uh, effort, but uh, uh, from swamp to Aegean stables to, uh, uh, to just pure clearing the decks, we have approached it from a standpoint of trying to lift up the moral premise of the programs that should touch the lives of needy people and Im combat poverty and hopelessness and homelessness and despair not be allowed to be ripped off by developers or speculators or consultants of either party and it happened in the last eight years to be my party uh, and I take umbrage at those who did it uh, I am as morally outraged as every single member of your party Mr. Chairman and the members of my party including this president who wants to bring it to an end clear the decks, get started on the great goal of bringing about a renaissance, if you will, a rebirth of our urban areas and pockets of poverty wherever they may exist. So uh, it's been about three months to the day since I was last here. Uh, I talked about uh, on July 12th before your committee of using all of our resources to bring about affordable housing and fighting poverty and help the homeless and to implement the fair housing laws and to bring uh, to encourage and, and incentivize uh, the private sector to do its part recognizing there's a public sector role and certainly recognizing today as I know all of us do the great role that the voluntary sector the nonprofit sector the Jim Rouses and and uh, uh, I shouldn't, uh, and the churches and synagogues, they're just incredible resources that we can bring to bear on this problem. Notwithstanding, I recognize our role at the federal level. Uh, I have, as I said, been very grateful for the bipartisan spirit that's been manifested in this committee. Uh, I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, your kind remarks about our reforms, and you two, uh, uh, Chalmers, and Marge and, and uh, uh, Bruce and everybody here and, and it's uh, and as I said we've taken many of our ideas frankly from members of this committee uh, but I don't want to leave out GAO or the IG or uh, folks who have been working with me at HUD for the last uh, uh, three months uh, including Lantos, Tom Lantos and uh, Moynihan, Senator Moynihan and Senator Byrd etc. Um, as you mentioned Mr. Chairman some of these reforms can be unilaterally implemented, some will need the cooperation of the Congress. Uh, as you mentioned also, it is involved in three basic areas of HUD. Uh, ethics, uh, management, and uh, Federal Housing Administration, FHA. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, minute detail on the more than 60 reforms that we announced, but I would like to at least uh, briefly survey uh, the reforms that we're calling for in those three significant areas. Many of the problems that have existed at HUD were allowed to happen because decisions were made in the dark, decisions were made subjectively, suggestion, uh, decisions were made without a clear-cut, objective, analytical, empirical basis. So our first effort, Mr. Chairman, was to take all of the decision-making that might be subjectively decided on a political basis, be it Republican or Democrat in the future, and take out politics from, the, from, those, from those decisions and make sure that every community in the country, every public housing authority, every city, every mayor, every nonprofit, every 
contractor would know that there were rules of engagement, if you will, that there were clear, objective, definable, empirical criteria by which the decisions were to be made. And then secondly, to make sure that everything was done in sunlight, sunshine, uh, in the light of day, that there would be no decision at HUD that would be done by Kemp or Delabovi or Keating or Fitz or staff or assistants or anyone based upon influence or who you know at HUD or what political party you belong to or how many consultants you hire and how much you pay them. And to the extent possible, let me assure each and every one of you, I believe with all my heart that I can appear before you as a man of candor who served with you for many years in the Congress and tell you flat out, under my stewardship at HUD and under this president, we will remove all politics and subjectivity to the extent humanly possible from HUD. Everything will be published in the Federal Register. Every lawyer, consultant, man or woman of influence who wants to do business, and the influence is not pejorative, but any man or woman of any influence who does business with HUD is going to know that their, our decisions will be published for all to see in the Federal Register for the press, for the Congress, and as I say, definable objective criteria. I hate to interrupt, but will you yield to me? Absolutely. We now have 27 members plus, sufficient number for the formalities of the subpoena, subpoena uh, notices being issued. As we had discussed, the House goes in at 10. So we were going to recess this hearing and reconvene the committee and uh, with the formalities to comply with, the committee meets pursuant to notice to authorizations of subpoenas in connection with the committee's investigation of the operation, supervision, conservatorship, and receivership of Lincoln Savings and Loan Association and its various relationship with American Continental uh, Corporation and any subsidiaries of American Continental Corporation or Lincoln Savings and Loan Association. We have uh, just finished wrestling with the biggest problem, I think, the Congress. Mr. Chairman, in before we go to vote, I, I honestly Chairman. believe that we should have a roll call to determine the members. Of the okay, uh, good idea. Uh, Mr. Anuncio has reminded me that in accordance with the rule, we want to establish the fact that we have the 27 members, so I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. You're right. Chairman Gonzalez? Present. Mr. Nunzio? Present. Mr. Fauntroy? Mr. Neal? Mr. Hubbard? Present. Mr. LaFalse? Ms. Okar? Mr. Vento? Present. Mr. Bernard? Here. Mr. Garcia? Mr. Schumer? Mr. Frank? Here. Mr. Lehman? Mr. Morrison? Here. Ms. Kaptur? Here. Mr. Erdrich? Here. Mr. Carper, Mr. Torres, Mr. Kletchka, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Kanjorski, Mrs. Patterson, Mr. McMillan, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Flake, Mr. Mfume, Mr. Price, Ms. Pelosi, Mr. McDermott, Mr. Hoagland, Mr. Neal, Mr. Wiley, Mr. Leach, Mr. Shumway, yeah. Mr. Paris, yeah. Mr. McCollum, Mrs. Rokema, yeah. Mr. B. Ryder, Mr. Dreyer, Mr. Heiler, yeah. Mr. Ridge, yeah. Mr. Bartlett, Mr. Roth, yeah. Mr. McCandless, Mr. Saxton, Mrs. Psyche, Mr. Bunning, yeah. Mr. Baker, Mr. Stearns, Mr. Gilmore, Mr. Paxson. Here. Mr. Kennedy's here.
28 members present. There being 28 a sufficient number to proceed. The chair will recognize the ranking minority member of the committee, Mr. Wiley, for an opening statement and a uh, motion. I'm dispensing with uh, my opening statement and asking leave that uh, for the sake of proceeding and seeing if we can get a vote before we go and record our vote in the House. My opening statement is very brief. Uh, we have talked to Mr. Chairman and I support the issuance of the subpoenas and we'll be glad to make the motion here momentarily. But the Lincoln failure uh, may be the most costly of all the SNL failures and uh, some have estimated that uh, it may be as much as $2 billion. And I think we owe it to the taxpayers to find out what went wrong. Uh, establishing a, a definitive case history will not restore the losses, of course, but it may help ensure that the same costly mistakes are not repeated. Uh, we're all aware that there are criminal and civil actions pending, and uh, we certainly don't want to compromise those in any way, but we do need the information which we can elicit uh, from these witnesses. And so uh, I would move that uh, under the jurisdiction assigned to the committee, under Rule 10 of the Rules of the House, that the committee authorized the chairman to issue subpoenas pursuant to Rule 11, Clause 2M of the Rules of the House and Rule 5 of the committee rules for the appearance of the persons and entities listed in the documents before the members for the purpose of providing testimony and documents relative and pertinent to the investigation of the operation, supervision, conservatorship, and receivership of Lincoln Savings and Loan Association and its various relationships with American Continental Corporation and any subsidiaries of Lincoln Savings and American Continental Corporation. Mr. Chairman, I so move. Uh, Mr. Leach, were you seeking recognition? Mr. Chairman, just for 15 seconds, just simply to note that there are a number of people on this list that, that uh, may be offered what might be considered unfriendly subpoenas, but there are many reputable people that the committee is offering friendly subpoenas to, and I think it should be clear that there's nothing pejorative in the receipt of a subpoena, and that many of the uh, uh, most responsible public regulators, et cetera, are included in the list of those that might be embarrassed by uh, this particular test. Yeah, that's precisely why uh, this decision was made. Some have requested subpoenas. Uh, and we want no stigma to attach to anybody, so we are issuing a request to each and every one of those listed as witnesses. That is the most appropriate uh, caveat, and mm -hmm. I would say that that is uh, true in the case of about half of the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Leach. The question is on the motion made by Mr. Wiley. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, no. We have to have a roll call, so the clerk will call the roll. Chairman Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Nunzio? Present. Mr. Fauntroy? Uh, I by um, proxy. Mr. Neal? I think we have to have live. Mr. Hubbard? We have to be live. Aye. Mr. LaFalse? You Ms. Okar? Mr. Vento? Aye. Mr. Bernard? Present. Mr. Garcia? Mr. Schumer? Mr. Frank? Aye. Mr. Lehman? Aye. Mr. Morrison? Aye. Ms. Kaptur? Mr. Erdrich? Mr. Carper? Mr. Torres? Aye. Mr. Kletchka? Aye. Mr. Nelson? <coughs> Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mrs. Patterson? <coughs> Mr. McMillan? Mr. Kennedy? Aye. Mr. Flake? Aye. Mr. Mfume? Mr. Price, Ms. Pelosi, Aye. Mr. McDermott, Mr. Hoagland, Aye. Mr. Neal, Aye. Mr. Wiley, Aye. Mr. Leach, Aye. Mr. Shumway, Aye. Mr. Paris, Aye. Mr. McCollum, Mr. Ro Ms. Rokema, Aye. Mr. B. Ryder, Mr. Dreyer, Aye by proxy, Mr. Heiler, Aye. Mr. Ridge, Aye. Mr. Bartlett, Mr. Roth, Mr. McCandless. Aye by proxy. Mr. Saxton, Mrs. Psyche, Mr. Bunning, Aye. Mr. Baker, Mr. Stearns. Aye Mr. by proxy. Mr. Gilmore. Aye by proxy. Mr. Paxson. Yes. Uh, Mr. Clerk, 
We have Pontroy by proxy, Ms. Uh, Okar by proxy, Mr. Garcia by proxy, Mr. Schumer by proxy, Mr. Nelson by proxy, Ms. Patterson by proxy, Mr. McMillan by proxy, Mr. Mpumi by proxy, and Mr. McDermott by proxy. And Mr. Bartlett by proxy. Mr. Bernard is uh, recorded as present. Mr. Bernard, aye. <laughs> Twenty-seven members answered the call of the roll. Forty-one ayes, no nays. There being forty-one ayes, no nays, the motion is agreed to. The uh, committee will stand recess in order to take a vote, and uh, I urge the members to report back as soon as possible. Ms. Secretary, again, excuse us here for this vote. The committee will please come to order. Mr. Secretary, again. We apologize and thank you at the same time for your patience. And uh, we're now ready to give you full attention and proceed. Yes, Miss Secretary. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we um, uh, had to depart for urgent uh, House responsibilities, I was uh, uh, responding to the need for sunshine, and I think I've made my point, and I won't uh, over-dramatize it, but I want to reiterate my commitment to each and every member of the Congress and to the press and to everybody that our decisions will be publicly uh, all notifications will be for the public, they'll be in the Federal Register, and the reasons for making the decision will be uh, part of that public record. Uh, I have asked, I think, earlier that my whole testimony be put in the record, but I wanted to get to a couple other points. Waivers. Uh, it's no secret that waivers were being made by people deep in the bowels of uh, our agency and uh, were leading to some... Absolutely. You made a statement about notifying everything is going to be made public. I wish you would keep in mind the members of Congress. As long as I've been a member of the Congress, no department, wherever there was a grant in my city or a project, that the congressman in that city was not notified. I must tell you that the previous administration that I didn't receive, and many of my colleagues did not receive, notification of what was happening in their district as far as HUD and projects were concerned. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Annunzio, you can uh, be assured that we want to do this up front and not only publicize the decision, but to give the reasons Knowing you as well as I do, it. I thank you very thank much, you. and I know it's going to be up front. And if there is inside information being used by some uh, to gain an unfair advantage uh, for political or personal gain, uh, I have asked uh, for an ability to impose a civil penalty of up to $10,000. Uh, I have suggested that every waiver at HUD uh, will have to go through an assistant secretary. It's no secret that they were made uh, in ways that uh, I, in fact, in my testimony, I talked about uh, a developer in the North Shore of Chicago who was charging rents up to $2,600 uh, per month, and uh, uh, it was a waiver that allowed that to happen. So there are such extraordinary cases of abuse of the waiver process that we are going to radically alter the way 
uh, business is done and those waivers will have to be uh, uh, accounted for by my assistant secretaries and I think that in that is kind of the impression not the kind of impression that is the impression that I want to give this committee that accountability right from the top available down. for the record who this the name of the person who was granted <coughs> yes, the waiver I read about it in the Tribune, by the way. Uh, yeah, well, just, just, I'm not finished. Well, he wasn't Mr. Anuncio's constituent, that's for sure. He couldn't be. <laughs> well, if he was my constituent, I'd know he'd be in a federal prison because he'd be <laughs> writing to me for a transfer of prisons. <laughs> <laughs> Is this, this man who you're speaking about, Mr. Secretary, I would like the record to show his name. I would like to know if he's in prison, that's what the, prison he's in, sure that's where he belongs. We're talking about $50 million. And the project failed. And uh, it is a, you know, talk about trickle-down economics, that is the most outrageous claim of helping the poor that I have ever heard of. And you will have all of the evidence, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the record. You're writing for the record. I'd like the name of the person in your agency who granted that waiver. Name you'll have, of the person you'll in have, the agency. You'll have the full uh, IG report and all the press. Uh, I thank you very much. Um, one other thing I, w I hope to do, Mr. Chairman, and with your concurrence, uh, I would like to abandon the practice of a discretionary FUD. Not only in CDBG, but in every housing assistance program so that you will know, Mr. Chairman, and your colleagues and your party and my colleagues will know that the Secretary is not making uh, d uh, 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 use of some type of a slush fund or discretionary fund. There will be, over time, uh, reasons for emergency aid to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and we, we will ask for a line item uh, uh, appropriation for those extraordinary circumstances of a public, uh, you know, a, a, a disaster or for fulfilling our commitments to the civil rights uh, laws and to our fair housing laws, but I want that to be... Uh, Secretary, will you yield to me at that point? Yes. I, I want to applaud you for that. Uh, we were against granting that uh, budgetary your predecessor, though, was the first one who, to insist on this uh, type of uh, set aside for the secretary's discretion. It was obvious, uh, I guess, um, since 1984, 85 particularly, that some of the members were reporting uh, that are charging that some use of those discretionary funds were being diverted for political purposes in their areas and that they were facing opposition by some local assisted HUD officials and funds. So I applaud that. I think uh, that's correct. And uh, I, I, Again, I want to express my admiration. Thank you. Thank you. There are unforeseen housing problems and shortages, emergencies, desegregation efforts, litigation, other emergencies, but we'll ask for line item authority and not do it through the, you know, headquarters uh, fund. Um, let me get, turn to management of HUD and financial reform quickly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's no secret to you or your colleagues or to the press or anybody else that there's been a woeful uh, an inadequate uh, management system uh, at HUD. Uh, one clear example comes to mind, uh, if you can believe it, uh, Ms. Uh, Fitz, uh, Austin Fitz, FHA Commissioner, has a $300 billion portfolio and uh, one actuary. And if you can imagine what it is like to be the commissioner of FHA and uh, attempt to do the credible job that I know she will do and we want to do to, to make this important ingredient of the American dream a reality for more people, i.e. home ownership, uh, we are going to totally overhaul both the management and financial reporting uh, system 
uh, at HUD generally and in FHA specifically. Uh, in recent testimony before your committee, uh, Mr. Bauscher at the GAO uh, said that an important part of the solution to HUD and FHA's problems is to establish a chief financial officer. And many members of this committee on both sides of the aisle have called, and I see Mrs. Rakama uh, nodding her head. She is among them and others uh, for a chief financial officer. I want to assure you that I am not only going to appoint a man or woman as chief financial officer at HUD who will directly report to me and uh, my deputy, Al Delabovi, but I'm going to appoint a comptroller uh, at FHA who will report to our commissioner uh, and uh, to uh, our um, deputy, or my deputy, as well as me, and we're going to make sure, sir, that uh, we fulfill this very important responsibility that the Congress uh, has been calling for and GAO has called for. The uh, HUD closing agent embezzlement case uh, is uh, right up there with the mod rehab abuses. Uh, uh, there was no reconciling of the accounts. There was embezzlement, fraud, uh, criminal and civil misconduct. Um, embarrassing to the past administration at HUD. And uh, we're going to remove that lack of accountability, require bonding, require standards, require certification of anyone who's doing business as a closing agent uh, with HUD and make sure that we have not only the comptroller, I mean the chief financial officer involved, but I can assure you that uh, that type of practice will not occur again to the extent that Jack Kemp uh, has uh, and his team has the ability to do so. Uh, we, are, we want to propose an amendment, Mr. Chairman, here's where Congress is going to be involved, among other places, uh, to Section 7.0 of the Housing and Urban Development Act to permit more expeditious legislative review. Um, I recognize that that uh, section is an important tool for oversight by your committee, the Banking Committee, and existing procedures can subject HUD to some delays, and in light of our current reform initiatives, Mr. Chairman, I think that a lack of reform here could hinder our ability to institute the necessary policy changes and statutory mandates. I want to increase the targeting of CDBG. Uh, these are scarce resources. They ought to go to fighting poverty, not building swimming pools and park benches and bike racks. And I've got nothing against riding bicycles or swimming in swimming pools. But our scarce resources ought to be used to fight poverty and fulfill our commitment for affordable housing and to rehabilitate and refurbish the existing stock before we allow these precious CDBG monies up to $3 billion in FY90 to be used for anything but the low-income communities and low-income peoples that we uh, have expressed our concern about. So I appreciate very much, Mr. Chairman, meeting with you and talking about this and Mr. Wiley and talking about how we can more carefully and closely target our CDBG money towards needy people and needy communities and fighting poverty, not allowing some of these um, extraneous development projects. Now therein lies, uh, I know, a very serious uh, question. What is development for the community and what is uh, an anti-poverty. I just think we're going to have to use uh, some of our own wisdom and watch this very carefully, but I would hope that we can work together to make sure that CDB used is, CDBG is used not for big hotels, uh, uh, but is used uh, for combating this uh, terrible stain on our democracy's inability heretofore to help lift people up out of poverty and get them on that ladder of self-reliance that we all acknowledge is, is the American dream. Uh, I, I, we need more monitoring, uh, 18, 17 billion dollars spent, believe it or not, less than 25 million spent for monitoring our programs. I would like to have the authority to use up to a half a percent uh, of our money and programs, which would be, I guess, up to 100 million. It wouldn't be uh, 100 million or more, but it would be allow us to use up to that much to more closely monitor uh, these programs and make sure they're 
accomplishing the goals uh, for which they required. Let me turn quickly to FHA. Uh, it's no secret that FHA needs sweeping reform. It is, as you have pointed out, and, and both sides agree, one of the most important ingredients in expanding the American dream of home ownership that has ever been designed. <coughs> uh, I am a strong supporter. Austin Fitz uh, is a strong supporter. And they, we operate 47, excuse me, 47 different insurance programs with a portfolio of $300 billion with, as I said, one actuary. We're going to have an actu independent actuarial study done to help our FHA managers assess the impact of the changing economic conditions. Um, our FHA accounts were lumped together indiscriminately in the past. There's been very little accountability. We're going to put an end to that. And, and the one program that I wanted to end that has caused our general insurance fund serious problems was, was the Title X land development scheme that allowed golf courses to be built in California and Florida. And again, I don't have anything against golf courses, but it doesn't stand the test of fighting poverty. And uh, we asked through regulation an end to the Title X program. There were, I think, 53 Title X programs. Half, over, almost half were in default. Uh, and building golf courses and swimming pools and tennis courts and health spa in California or New York or anywhere in this country just doesn't meet the test that I think you would require uh, all of us to uh, live up to. Uh, so I have tried to eliminate Title X legally through rulemaking. Our single family insurance program has been the cornerstone, as I suggested earlier, of our need to meet the mortgage financing needs of low and moderate income families and first time home buyers. Uh, FHA was never intended, Mr. Chairman, to create opportunities for profit by real estate speculators, so we're asking for an end to the uh, private investors uh, who many times walk away from these properties. And I'm not against private investment, I'm not against the, the entrepreneurial capitalistic system, but I don't want uh, HUD and FHA to be used to where about 2% of the investors in FHA uh, policies accounted for more than 15 percent of all the losses in our uh, single-family uh, insurance fund. Um, Co-insurance is debatable. I happen to think that it is uh, still a program for multifamily housing and uh, part of our urban strategy. If we walk away from co-insurance, we're going to have to explain to urban America why we're going to have very little impact upon this very important need in urban America. So I have uh, 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 worked with Austin and Al and Frank and my team to come up with a tightly regulated, more closely controlled and monitored co-insurance program. And we have debarred, Mr. Chairman, uh, some co-insurance, uh, private uh, co-insurance uh, uh, companies, lenders from doing any business with HUD. Uh, you'll be glad to know that I shut off the program. I shut it down. We've reorganized it, reopened it, and we have barred companies like DRG from ever doing business with the federal government again because of the outrageous $600 million that they have cost the American people, taxpayers. Worse, it was a uh, abandonment of uh, the very legitimate program needs of helping low and moderate income people in urban America. Uh, we want to stop those windfall profits by redesigning the low income housing tax credit. It's no secret that I am a supporter of using the tax code for low income housing and low income economic development through enterprise zones. But uh, we don't want people to double dip by using the, F the low income housing tax credit combined with a section eight rental uh, uh, project driven subsidy and then huge and, and no one ever counted up the benefits to the developers. So we want to call into account those developers who are using subsidies along with the low income housing tax credit and bring an end to those windfall <laughs> profits so we can rest assured that we are using our scarce resources for legitimate needs. That's the end of my testimony. I'm sure there's a lot of questions, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman. I'll thank you for your patience and your, and your support and that of both sides of the aisle. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, I'm going to defer to the members that haven't had that opportunity. I did want to point out uh, some things in all uh, fairness to some of us who have been aboard uh, for a few years. Uh, your recommendation that we uh, change that requirement on uh, 
the legislative days required for you to withhold the promulgation of rules or even the announcement of rules. Uh, I'd like to point out that that was kind of foisted on us. Uh, our minority members, <laughs> when you had a different administration administering HUD, uh, was their way of uh, seeking accountability. We never really favored it. Uh, we didn't think it was a good idea to begin with. But nevertheless, the intent then was to monitor the uh, promulgation of rules and making sure that the congressional intent would not be subverted. With respect to uh, your general outline intentions, I can tell you that uh, I see no reason why uh, you wouldn't have enthusiastic support on both sides of the aisle here. And I don't think that there is any soul in or out of the Congress that doesn't um, realize your full integrity and honesty of purpose and performance. Mr. Wiley? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, may I say the uh, requirement on uh, the rules uh, went into effect before I became uh, the ranking minority <laughs> member on the committee. <laughs> Uh, you looked at my direction and said something about it was a minority. Well, I looked in that direction, but actually at that time the minority was really in a minority status and very defensive. And, uh, but the intent you couldn't quarrel with, and that was to make sure. You're, you're, you're not suggesting, are you, Mr. Issues. Chairman, that the minority is about ready to become the majority, uh, are you? Well, you're gonna I don't want to insinuate things beyond <laughs> plain meaning. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to say to the Secretary that I am quite pleased with your reform package uh, that you have been elaborating on today, and I compliment you for it. Uh, you honed in on the uh, Community Development Block Grant uh, Targeting Program and the Section 8 uh, <coughs> Rental Adjustment Procedures, uh, and those provisions bother me some. Uh, but not to the extent that I'm not ready to sign off on your package. But I think I would be remiss if I didn't suggest that um, the Community Development Block Grant program has been used effectively and well in Columbus, Ohio. Mr. De La Boba was in Columbus not long ago, and I think he would uh, testify to that. But our mayor uh, will be a little bit upset in that uh, it will not have uh, the discretion. You stated your objective is that the CDG program should be targeted at waging a war on poverty. That was not the original intent of it, of course, to right. be an anti-poverty program, as you know, and we've discussed this a little bit, but I just <coughs> thought maybe you might want to elucidate for this member on the record. Uh, I agree that it should not be used uh, for, uh, for a high-rise apartment uh, buildings, but on the other hand, I think it has been used effectively in some areas in my own yes. city of Columbus to revitalize the downtown area. Yes, sir. And uh, it was because of the discretionary aspect of it that we were able to do that, frankly. Could I, could I just make a quick response? Because coming from Buffalo, I can assure you that I think CDBG has been used effectively in many cities, including Buffalo and Columbus and I'm sure other members. And I, I, I have talked to the mayors and governors, and I don't think there's a... I don't think there's a whole lot of disagreement. In fact, uh, from talking to Al Delabovi when he got back from Columbus and having been in Columbus, Ohio myself uh, several times, many of the things that have happened in Columbus would still, on merit, be encouraged under the CDBG targeting. Uh, I want to assure the gentleman from Columbus. But uh, I want to remind everybody that the statute says that the principal purpose of CDGB funding is to benefit low and moderate income individuals and funds should be authorized to be used for activities that aid the prevention or eliminations of slum and blight and eliminate the conditions that present a serious hazard and fight poverty. So I think if we can come to some agreement um, about targeting a little bit better, I, I, I think we can remove what I thought and saw were some of the abuses without harming the very legitimate economic development and anti-poverty tools that we need to use from Columbus to Every other city, and I'm just saying that I don't want to think. I don't think we should take away all flexibility, though, uh, and uh, just direct it to uh, necessarily low-income housing. And I think that's a laudable aim and purpose too. But absolutely, since we uh, have done away with the revenue sharing, as you know, some of these cities have used this as a kind of a revenue sharing mechanism. Absolutely, uh, I know that. Well, uh, 
I thought I'd I say I had to get that in. Now, I agree that the FHA program is one of the greatest programs that we've ever had, and it has provided uh, funds for uh, first-time home ownership, and uh, I was the author of amendment which made the FHA program permanent, and with the support of the chairman, we were able to get that through. Uh, you mentioned uh, that the GA report on the status of the uh, Federal Housing Administration cited uh, co-insurance and hospital insurance as the two major factors contributing to problems in the general insurance fund. And your reform package does talk about the uh, troubled insurance co-insurance program, but it doesn't uh, propose changes in the hospital insurance program. I might want to direct this to Ms. Fitz, if it's okay, uh, Mr. Secretary, Absolutely. to see if she's uh, looking into that. Austin. Yes, Congressman, as you know, the, uh, we have had a problem with the hospital portfolio. Uh, approximately 50 percent of that portfolio is in New York, and there are structural problems with the hospital system, cost containment in that system, which is causing uh, deterioration in many of those credits. Part of the problem is that there is split responsibility on managing the program. Uh, HHS is responsible for doing the underwriting and then we are responsible for managing the portfolio. Currently, uh, we are in negotiations with HHS as, the, as to the best way to improve the management of this, which is why you do not see something final in this reform package, because it really requires a joint effort of both agencies to solve the problem. But we are definitely working on it and are very aware of it, and it's a great concern to us. Well, I'm glad I asked the question. You did not overlook it. You're just in negotiations and you haven't finalized uh, the approach you want to take. We're, we're trying to work, work with uh, Dr. Sullivan at HHS to, resol to resolve this um, kind that of a conflict. mixture that mm -hmm. just doesn't work the way it should. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, this may be a premature question, but uh, we're under uh, heavy pressure to increase the mortgage limits on FHA. Uh, the Ohio uh, home builders uh, are opposed to increasing the limits. Uh, on FHA. There are other country, areas of the country which maybe it would uh, contribute to the program. I don't know. Uh, have you looked into that yet? Have you taken a position on what you... Well, what uh, Chalmers, and to each and, and you, Mr. Chairman, and all of the members who care about this FHA ceiling issue, um, you saw what the Senate did when they, uh, uh, in the um, Nichols Amendment to the HUD appropriation bill, raised the ceiling to 125, I think, thousand dollars. It hasn't been raised in a while. There is a necessity to raise it. We are having a full audit uh, of the circumstances and area uh, real estate markets that would require an adjustment. So we have favored an adjustment. I didn't particularly think that that was the vehicle by which it should be done, and I would have preferred to wait until the audit were d was done and we had more information, and then we could act in a more prudent way. I don't want to accuse anybody of acting imprudently, but I thought it should be done at a later time on a more uh, logical vehicle. Um, I do not favor, frankly, having looked at the issue from both sides and trying to uh, objectively determine where I thought we sh thought it should go. I didn't agree with the idea of taking it up to a hundred and what sixty or sixty-five, one hundred sixty-five thousand, yeah. because I thought that might trespass on the private sector, that it might be too high, that it might turn the program away a little bit from its original intention. And I know the good uh, reasons for doing so. I guess I came down on the side of indexing it oh. so that we would have a more objective uh, criterion and uh, that that would take it up to about 118. That's basically been my position, well, and be, I don't want FHA yeah. to compete with the private sector in this uh, regard. I'll be glad to have you expand on that, but it could be my uh, question is a little premature in that uh, Congressman Kletch, who is not here, asked uh, GAO for a study on this uh, issue, and uh, that hasn't come <coughs> back yet, as you pointed out. Uh, I've been given note, my time has expired, and we have a vote on, and I thank you very much, and I'll be back. I thank you. <laughs> the committee will recess for a vote. Mr. Chairman, could I just tell you, uh, uh, now that you're in recess, uh, even though it's over the microphone, I have to leave around 11.30. Mrs. Uh, Austin Fitz uh, has to leave. I, could I 
ask uh, Mr. Delabovi and and uh, and the general counsel uh, Frank Keating to stay. Uh, I'll I'll stay as long as I can and, and come back. But I have to leave around 11:30 or maybe 11:40. It's understandable and and certainly. Uh, I will be glad to. Yes. Does that yes. mean that when I come back, I can ask the the secretary? Yes. I'll be right back. You'll be next. <laughs> Members of the House Banking Subcommittee on Housing and Community Development are taking a recess. After this short break, we'll continue our coverage of this hearing held to look at the administration's proposed reform of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I picked up the telephone, which would lie on the table of my, my room, wherever I was in China, and they have a beautiful touch-tone system, which was installed at great extent. They bought it from France at the insistence of the Chinese army, so they have a good communication system. And I used it to call Charlotte in Taconic, Connecticut. And I would get through to her in about 20 seconds, and I could reassure her that uh, things were not as bad as they seemed when she was looking on the tube. And she could tell me what was the latest being shown on television in the United States and keep me up to date with the image that uh, the people in the United States were getting of what I was seeing only part of with my own eyes. Sunday on Book Notes, Harrison Salisbury, former New York Times reporter, talks about his latest book, Tiananmen Diary, 13 Days in June. Sunday on C-SPAN, beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 Pacific. C-SPAN is a non-profit cooperative created and supported by the cable television industry as a public service to its national cable television audience. In addition, C-SPAN is underwritten in part by the following. Mm -hmm. We are never content to stand still. The American Federation of Teachers, leading the way to a brighter future. Democracy isn't easy. It's people staying involved in their communities. It's a strong press and the literacy to read it. Gannett Foundation supports programs in communities and communications. It's all of us doing our part. General Instrument is pleased to help support programming on C-SPAN. We're the industry leader in cable TV electronics, coaxial cable, and satellite encryption systems. The company's primary strategies are directed toward communications systems. Up next, we'll continue our coverage of a hearing held by the House Banking Subcommittee on Housing and Community Development. Congressman Henry Gonzalez of Texas chairs the panel, which reviews the administration's plan to reform the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Testifying before the panel, is HUD Secretary Jack Kemp. I'm going to put your name on the screen. Committee will please come to order. Ms. Holker, you were about to be recognized. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for having this hearing. And Mr. Secretary, thank you for appearing once again. It's, it's always a pleasure to have you before this committee. Um, Mr. Secretary, I applaud your reforms. I've read your legislation or proposal, I should say, and I think they're um, right on target. But I want to I say this for the record, and I wanted to do it publicly, Jack. Uh, because I think it's very, very important um, to make this point. Um, the programs were not the reason uh, that there was abuse, fraud, uh, in, in, in criminal activity. It was not the programs in and of themselves. It was the management of the programs and all kinds of other ramifications. And all of the programs were not ill run, quite honestly. CDBG, you mentioned, uh, was an, is an excellent program that does not need new regulations, in my judgment. Uh, it was the discretionary use of CDBG in the Inspector General's report uh, that showed that a couple favors were given to a couple members of Congress in terms of swimming pools and all that. 
but in and of itself, that program oper operates very well. So to put up tight regulations that somehow close the gap and don't allow cities um, options, to me would be, you, you know, you, you have to be a little careful about that. I, I just want to say that. I also want to point out to you that um, I am very dismayed, and I have to tell you this uh, for the record, I'm dismayed that somehow I get the impression that if I call HUD relative, and it's certainly not in terms of your immediate staff, they've been terrific, but I don't want to feel guilty representing my constituents. And if I think that some people, your staff, are off base in terms in which they're evaluating certain things affecting my hometown, I have to tell you something, I'm not going to take it. I think that I'm elected to represent the people uh, that, that sent me here. And one of our charges is to be an ombudsman for our area. And if we're not ombudsmen for our area, we ought to be thrown out of office. On the other hand, if we're asking for something unreasonable or unethical and so on, then that's a whole different story. But if I feel that there are situations where I, you know, I'm trying to get housing for our area, whatever it happens to be, uh, and I have to feel that I can't even ask a question, I got to tell you, I think that's outrageous. Now, there's such a thing as overkill in all this, and, and, and reforms are no substitute for policy. I mean, I think you have to do both. You have to have the reforms, and that's part of the past, and I'm all for them, and I'll be the first one to support your package. But I also think you have to have a program. You have to get on with the show and, and tell us what it is you're going to do relative to your being secretary. You inherited a terrible situation. And you were ready, um, I think, to go at new ideas and so on. And I know you have them. But I'm anxious to pass on some plans that you have, along with my chairman's and this committee's philosophy. So, so um, uh, you know, I just wanted to say there's such a thing as overkill for the sake of, and what you might be doing inadvertently and unintentionally is prohibiting programs that operate well. And for those areas of the country that operate their programs with integrity and have seen the effectiveness of HUD programs, um, you know, we really need those programs. Now, to me, the purpose of HUD is certainly poverty, but it's also, in addition, as an adjunct to create jobs and to demonstrate uh, the, uh, the ability of our country uh, to provide safe and decent housing and accessibility to safe and decent housing for every American. So I, I don't mean to do this public little lecture here, but I'll tell you something. I, I, um, I think that there are times when I get the impression that what we're going to do is have this fortress now uh, built up as an overreaction uh, and a substitute for programming. And I, I, for one, have to say publicly that I don't want to see that happen. And, and I, I don't think you want to see that happen, but I want to caution you that, that it gives me the impression that somehow that is going to happen. And we need a program, and we also need uh, people on your staff. And I know you don't have all your staff yet. I think it's outrageous that you don't have them all approved by the Senate and all that. But I think you need a staff that is sensitive, that when a legitimate question is asked, that they respond courteously and give you really in-depth answers. And if that, you know, if, if that doesn't happen, I'm telling you, I think that's wrong. Be happy to you. Making an important statement, and uh, the implication, I don't think it's been made by uh, present people at HUD, but the implication that if a congressman calls about a project in his district, there's something wrong, I think is, uh, is most unfortunate. And uh, there have been some statements made like that, but I'm sure that the former member of Congress here, our good colleague, Mr. Kemp, uh, doesn't feel that way, that it's, uh, <laughs> that it's wrong for us to call about a project in our district, necessarily. Well, I, I, I just want to say, though, also, that I think these regulations that would prohibit well-operated programs in areas across this country would be wrong uh, to change. 
and to stifle the certain degree of flexibility that CDBG has uh, with its intention would be, would be absolutely outrageous to me because I am not responsible because somebody in New York got a swimming pool or something. My city operates that program well and I don't want to see some guidelines change that's going to inhibit my city's opportunity to use its money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a little, uh, the distinguished lady has expired, and Mr. Secretary, uh, you, you said you had to leave. I mean, that, there's an impression being left uh, that I would like to at least, uh, it, with brevity, um, yeah, answer and, <laughs> and touche, you know, Mr. To touche, leave. Mr. Chairman. I'm just trying to respect your wishes. I, I just want to assure that. We'd love to keep you here. Yeah, but I want to assure the chairman and, and members on both sides. I hope I have an, I'm not here with an arrogant attitude. Uh, there, if any man or woman at HUD who's politically appointed or career, careered at HUD uh, is disrespectful to a member of Congress, I would personally fire him or her. Uh, I am not disrespectful. You have never been treated by me or any of my staff disrespectfully. We have nothing but admiration having served in the Congress, and that wasn't what you were suggesting. So let me just at least put that uh, to rest. But Mary Rose, you are uh, a vital uh, member of the House of Representatives and the committee that has oversight and interested in and have co-sponsored legislation with me in the past. Let me say to you, I think it's going to be hard for me to defend. And frankly, I think it is hard for our, my friends on the Democratic side to defend a program that allows monies to be spent uh, without some guidelines that target it towards fighting poverty, distressed communities, developing those infrastructures that are critical to the development. Of, and that is exactly what you share, so I'm not uh, uh, disagreeing with you. But how can targeting CDBG 75 percent to anti-poverty criteria uh, possibly be tightening the program so uh, restrictively that it is not going to meet the uh, uh, needs for which it was designed? And I want to assure the gentlelady from Ohio, CDBG can work uh, and continue to work. It meets uh, uh, many fond, uh, many important goals. I support CDBG. I have fought for adequate funding of CDBG, and I'm not out to gut it, and I don't make swimming pools the sole criteria by which I made my judgment to try to tighten it up to fight poverty. That was one incident, though, Jack, and that's, Mr. Secretary, pardon me, uh, if I could just respond. You know, I think that, that if you look across the country, that is the one program that really has been operated in a very comprehensively fine fashion. At least I can say that about my own city. And, and I, some of us were with that program from the get-go, and we changed the regulations, did we not, Mr. Chairman, to target uh, more poverty uh, targeting uh, for CDBG, and some people didn't like it, but we changed it. And, and it's, it, it's operated well. And I'm saying there have been tremendous abuses. But don't blame the program. You, we just need better management. We have that management. You You're hear, here. You so. did not hear me blame CDBG. I am a supporter of CDBG. I think it should be targeted at about 75, and you think it should be 60. But I mean, that's hardly uh, Kemp uh, scorched earth policy. Uh, in the city of Cleveland or any other place. But I don't think our argument is uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, divisive as it might appear. And I didn't want to leave the impression. But you, you have my assurance on both sides out. If anybody calls us, you have a right. You should be fighting for your city. And if you want a rock and roll museum built in Cleveland and you think that's a legitimate use of UDAG funds and we study it and, and say that but for UDAG it, could, it should be done in the private sector, that's a legitimate argument. But if anybody treats you with disdain, they'll be fired. And if I want for downtown Cleveland and, and I have some phony baloney uh, regulations put up as a smoke screen so our area does not get housing for downtown Cleveland, uh, you better believe I'm going to fight you on that. Good. I, I'm a fighter. And, and I sent my undersecretary to Cleveland. I plan to come to Cleveland. We're not out to do anything 
what impression has been given to this committee that Jack Kemp is out for some type of, you think I would point out Cleveland? We want the Cleveland community to, I mean, I want to be a successful HUD secretary. I can't do it without your help. But I have to call them as I see them, and we don't think a UDAG grant for a rock and roll museum was necessarily, uh, it did not fit the criteria did not fit the criteria. And if I don't have criteria, you're going to haul me up before this committee and have my head for doing things that are not fighting poverty, building houses, taking care of the poor, and meeting the criteria that have been laid on me by the U.S. Congress with which I uh, agree. So, I Just for the record, I was not necessarily talking about that grant, Jack, and I frankly am a little dismayed that you raised that, but if you want to raise it, you know, I'll be happy to debate it publicly with you. I'm not picking on, uh, I don't want to pick on rock and roll. My children would... Uh... Mr. Roth, you were seeking... Uh... Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, you recognizing me. I, I think it's important here to say that the people are the problem, not, not the programs. I think it's going a little bit too far. I think the programs are the problem. Well, there were some but, flaws in the programs. You bet. But you I don't bet. come I up just... here... I didn't come up here, Toby, and blame all of the programs. I didn't say it was just systemic. No, I, it would have been easy to do because there fact, are some really flawed in, in programs. Fact, my, but my, my opinion, Mr. Secretary, is you didn't go enough, uh, 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 far enough in that direction. I think the, pro, the, pro, the problem does, does lie with uh, programs to a great degree. But to make Congress feel good to say, hey, these programs aren't the, are the problem, is to say that Congress isn't the problem. And that's a bunch of baloney. We all know that. There's These plenty of blame to go around. These programs have to be cleaned up. And if the secretary of HUD has to, it'd be like a, a, a quarterback in a football team. If, if the fans were going to call all the plays, you wouldn't call any plays. And we have to have a quarterback in there, Mr. Secretary, and you're our quarterback. And that's why I think that we have to take some direction from you. These programs are flawed. And just to say that we're going to change a few people is not going to get the job done. Well, I, I beg of you not to use football metaphors, but since you <laughs> used one. Well, Chair will recognize Ms. Rockham. She had been seeking recognition, and I didn't notice her, uh, Ms. Roth. But I was going to say that at the very outset, I said that it was more a people's problem than a program problem. So we're seeing things in very diametrically opposed ways. Uh, Ms. Rockema? Mr. Secretary. If you're not going to change the Not really. <laughs> Since I'm the head secretary, let me say, in looking at that there's plenty of blame to go around, there was gross mismanagement of the programs, and there were some systemic flaws that we are trying to correct, and I don't think it makes any uh, rational, uh, uh, doesn't make for rational discourse to try to say it was all one or the other. Well, we're going to put an end to it. Instead of just cursing the darkness, let's light some candles. And the gentlelady from New Jersey is one of the chief candle lighters uh, for reform, and I would like to hear her question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Do you have time to, for just another few minutes? Um, I, I all right, let me, let me ask uh, two quick questions, and if you cannot give me an answer now, because they may re they obviously, in one case, uh, require more time. Otherwise, you would have included it in your statement. And I'll start in the reverse order. But I'd like to follow very closely what you've been saying on page 11 concerning the layering of HUD subsidies. I think this gets to the heart of a very important issue. And uh, it, it, it is to the issue of where some programs are absolutely wrong. Yes. And that's a structural problem right there. Uh, in addition, there were abuses of even the structural problem. I mean, the, the, the abuses that were attendant to this were mind-boggling in terms of the actual fees. Um, but you haven't um, given any specifics here, so I assume that you don't have the specific legislation as to how you're, you're going to precisely prevent the double dipping that you've referred to and um, also reforms uh, in the tax, so the syndication and the tax right. benefits. Um, that's on page 11. So uh, I would like to be working with you. I think every member of this committee would like to um, bird dog this issue. Uh, and you may have the final version actually ready uh, or close to being ready, but um, are you able to amplify on this beyond uh, yes. what's stated here? Well, first of all, I appreciate the question. The legislation is at OMB. We're going to send it uh, to the Hill, and uh, it specifically addresses the question of double dipping by allowing us to adjust our subsidy uh, to the level of the tax benefit 
that the syndicator or syndication receives from the LITC. Uh, so, you so in effect, no, yeah, you would I'm no sorry. longer have the most egregious uh, examples right. of where people were getting fifteen hundred oh, yeah. dollars per unit in uh, in consulting fees, and then the multiplicity of the t the syndication of tax subsidies uh, amounted to mind-boggling uh, 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 profits and absolutely hundreds of millions of if not billions of dollars in some cases. Million, yes. All right, so you're going to have that quite soon. It, by by regulation, we are going to oh. require that By there, regulation, are you by doing regulation, this? Not, I'm not told legislation? By, well, I, I understand I can do it by regulation, that we can count up the value of the subsidy, or the, the uh, tax credit, and, the, and uh, the value of the syndicated tax credit, and then adjust our subsidy under Section 8 to make sure that there are no windfall profits. And well, I am not opposed to windfall profits in private enterprise, but I am opposed different. to them when people get into government programs and we're going to put an end to those outrageous fees and profits and uh, conditions that thank were programmatically you. flawed right, for the thank record. Thank you. We will, we will look at the regulations and see if we feel that there is need for any legislation beyond that. But I certainly appreciate you. your leadership there. You. Uh, the second question I have regards um, <laughs> A certain dead end that I reached when I was trying to make crimes out of uh, some of the egregious uh, um, activities that we saw going on at HUD. Uh, one you referred to, for example, was in the Robin Hood uh, property disposition situation. Of course, um, the person that benefited the so-called Robin Hood may be under criminal indictment. Yes. Uh, but my concern is about uh, the people in the department. It would seem that the people in the department who aided and abetted are not criminally liable. And I would like to know whether, sir, you and your staff think they should be. I should, I would like them to be, quite frankly, but I haven't been able to figure out a way that, uh, that you do that in terms of uh, um, writing it into legislation. Uh, we were just kind of discussing yeah. as you were asking the it's question. A question. I don't think yeah. anyone at HUD um, was handing out the information. If they were, that is a criminal violation. It to, is. Uh, Presently, under present law, if, if the people at is staff, it, personnel? Well, th this is General Counsel Frank Eady. I'm yes. going to ask him to elaborate. Mr. But I, I want to make sure that I at least am on the record with regard to Robin Hood. She was no Robin Hood. It was no, not stealing was not. from the rich and helping the poor. She, yeah. uh, she was stealing from the poor to enrich herself, her children, and her so-called no friends. At all. So she should not be considered a Robin Hood or Hood. I don't know that because I think it's... Frank. Well, all, all the, having, why why don't we go on ahead and excuse the secretary? You stayed over 15 minutes beyond the time you Thank said you, you had to leave. Uh, I'll be happy to come back, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the forbearance of the I Chairman. I think in all committee. fairness to you, though, we should release you and allow you to leave. And if Mr. Keaton can stay, as you indicated, uh, we can have those answers. And then whatever else we have, we'll submit in writing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you again very much, Mr. Secretary. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Should I go? Ms. Rockman, the, the violation that you referred to 